Hello. Welcome to the fall quarter uh, D'Andreas Rosati Memorial Archives Lecture. I'm Scott Kelly and I work in the Office of Mission and Values. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce or reintroduce you to Sister Betty Ann McNeil, who has been a Vincentian scholar in residence here at DePaul uh, since 2012. Today is a special occasion for the Vincentian Studies Institute because we are celebrating the release of Sister Betty Ann's new book, Balm of Hope. Charity of Fire Impels Daughters of Charity, Civil War Nurses. Uh, this book makes a major contribution to our evolving understanding of the massive footprint that the Daughters of Charity have had in American health care for well over 150 years. Sister Betty Ann's careful and meticulous research over many years brings to life the memoirs of Daughters of Charity, Civil War Nurses. Sister Betty Ann transcribed, annotated, indexed, and published these very personal and very revealing accounts of the Civil War from the perspective of religious women acting from a profound sense of charity. This work, this perspective, is a compelling one in the midst of America's darkest, bloodiest, and most violent years. Their witness is a powerful testimony to the Vincentian mission and to the broader mission of healthcare providers. A few words about Sister Betty Ann. It is not often we get to celebrate and recognize the work of one of our own community members. Uh, Sister McNeil entered the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul Emmitsburg Province in 1964. She earned a bachelor's degree in social welfare from St. Joseph College Emmitsburg, Maryland in 1969, and a master's of social work from Virginia Commonwealth University in 1975. A leading expert in the history of the Vincentian tradition, especially St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, and the early history of the Sisters of Charity in the United States, Sister McNeil has been a member of the Vincentian Studies Institute since 1988 and currently serves on its editorial board. Her publications include the Vincentian Family Tree, which is a survey of all communities related to Vincent de Paul, St. Louis de Marriac, and the Vincentian family published by the Vincentian Studies Institute in 1996. This work has made an important contribution to the Vincentian family's efforts to see themselves as a family that shares the same mission and spirit. Sister Betty Ann's expertise and contributions help position DePaul University as the premier location for Vincentian Studies, an ongoing commitment of the university that is vital to the history, heritage, and legacy of the Vincentian family. So thank you, Sister Betty Ann McNeil, for your work. Thank you, Scott. Can everyone hear me easily? First of all, I would also like to thank Father Ed Udovic who has been the presiding officer of Vincentian Studies Institute for numerous years, and for the, Father Dennis Holschneider for the opportunity to continue my research on this topic here at DePaul, and then for considering the outcome worthy of Vincentian Studies Institute of DePaul University's publication. This is not a book that you sit and read in one sitting. <laughs> but I can tell you how it's available through the <laughs> Satan Shrine shop at Evansburg or just online. Scott's very complete introduction about this publication is a real entree to say that I am not a public historian, a Civil War historian as a, on military strategy or the battle or the recruitment. But I come as one who has come to know many of the three or all of the 310 women who served as sister nurses during the Civil War. Each victim, each wounded soldier needed a caregiver, a nurse, a listener, an amanuensis to write letters, and someone to care about them. That is the role 
that the Daughters of Charity played. My book, my research focuses only on the Daughters of Charity, although there were about a dozen other communities that served in the same or similar capacity, but their memoirs are with their communities and the 310 Daughters of Charity were the largest number of religious women that were available. We were across the country and that's how we were strategically uh, demobilized. I would like to quote from a northern surgeon. <clears throat> and at this time in the 19th century, the term Sisters of Charity and Daughters of Charity was used interchangeably. How I admired the Sisters of Charity as to this matter when I was in Portsmouth, Virginia. They were called over from Norfolk to so serve their own men, the South, in the hospital and labored with untiring charity when a few weeks later, our men, the Northern ones, took the place at the same hospital was filled with Northern soldiers. These good sisters were called on again where they resumed their kind attentions as if they were the same men. This, he continued, was true Christian charity and I would not fear for any human misery when they have control. And he was speaking to a young lady he ended it, and this young lady is what all you ladies ought to be doing instead of following the armies for whatever reason. <laughs> Why did I do this and how did I get into it? I was walking down the aisle of the archives one day in Emmonsburg, Maryland, the Daughters of Charity archives, and I was looking in the Civil War record boxes and I opened a box that I really hadn't paid much attention to before and pulled out a folder that I hadn't seen and opened it up and was simply overwhelmed with what I saw. I knew that I had discovered the pearl of great price. Everything that I read in it smacked of servant leadership rooted in the founders, Vincent Louise and Elizabeth Seton in the United States. The book was old. The pages were worn. The pages were glued in as into a letter book. But a secretary with foresight had written in 19th century stylized hand with India ink. This collection is valuable for it gives names which have been suppressed in later transcriptions and are for the greater number the original notes sent in to Paris to for, in response to Father Berlando's requirement, unretrenched and unvarnished. That's all I needed to know. I compared the document with another document that we only have in typed form and concluded that for years, for 100 years, researchers have been using a redacted version. But this was the real thing. For that reason, I was determined that it would be available to the public. And in so doing, because Emmitsburg was located so close to Gettysburg, and there's such great interest in that site, I further decided to look for additional accounts, which I knew existed that were not in this book after I got into it, and other correspondence, and created a compendium so that anyone who would per purchase and, or use this book would really have a total overview of all of the Civil War records of the Daughters of Charity. Certainly if they would w want to see the original, they would have to travel. For the cover, because I wanted to highlight 
the Vincentian mission. On the right side of the screen <coughs> is a historic window that is in St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, commemorating the fact that the Daughters of Charity nursed in that building immediately after the battle. In fact, it was a surgery center and the recovery room was a sanctuary. So the book designer was able to extrapolate the figures and created the image which appears on the front of the book. I was very intentional about the title, the quote, Balm of Hope, are words that Father Belando, a Vincentian who was the director of the sisters, used in a letter. But I wanted to also capitalize on the Daughters of Charity seal and our motto. We also had previously done um, a series of books entitled Charity of Fire. So I just kept going forward with the concept of Charity of Fire. Father Berlando, in one of his letters to the sisters, wrote, our sisters knew from the first how to inspire patience among the wounded, infusing the balm of hope in wounded men whom the horrors of war have, as it were, brutified. So that's the source of the title. In toto, this tome includes 146 documents within that original book, plus 50 periodic illustrations, period, illustrations of the period, 19th century, six maps and tables. Sister Mary Dennis, who is the one who, the author, who about 20 years ago brought to the fore a compilation in her book to bind up the wounds of the work of all of the religious sisterhoods. So this compendium has three parts. The notes, which were the sisters' memoirs, additional recollections and accounts that I found scattered throughout archival boxes and annals that have been passed on through the years in various forms, but I chose the earliest, and correspondence. Because I wanted this to be a resource, I created an appendix that would be useful to students and anyone who is not familiar with Catholic terminology, so there is a glossary and there's data that the sisters themselves had left about arrivals and departures at the largest union hospital and a selected bibliography for further study, which I will distribute um, upon the completion of this talk. I was very grateful to the many archives and museums that provided me access and permission to publish some of the 19th century um, images. And this is not only famous because we've seen it so many times, but it's by Winslow Homer. Homer. Where were the Daughters of Charity and how did we get around? As you see, at the beginning of the war, we were in the south and we were in the north. We had just opened a mission or two missions here in California. So we were spread out. We also were well known. Now one question that I have been asked frequently, how about those girls that were sisters from the deep south? How did they feel about taking care of the union wounded and sick? Well, I did an analysis of the membership of those 310 for which we had recorded data for their place of birth. The majority of the sisters that served were born in, 42% um, were born in Ireland, 40% in the United States, 
and 8% in Germany. And that's, we only had data for 90% of the sisters on their birth. Um, of those born in the United States, 51% were from states dependent on slavery, from an agricultural economy, primarily Maryland and Louisiana. And 59% were from northern areas, more familiar with industrialization and urban areas, primarily Pennsylvania and New York. The sisters, there was absolutely no choice of where you would serve. You were sent on a mission of health, education, and welfare. And if a battle happened 10 miles down the road, you went to take care of the sick and the wounded. So the sisters native to the south served wherever the need was, and the sisters from the north served wherever the need was. We recognized that the majority of the fighting was in the south, but the largest um, hospital for the Union was in Philadelphia, and we had over 100 sisters there, or 91 in total. The sisters lived the Vincentian tradition, and this is a quote from St. Vincent of the 17th century. Whether I'm sent to this place or that, or call back here to be sent somewhere else, it will be all the same to me. Whether for a short time or a long time, whether to live there or die there, I'm content, and I won't worry about what could happen provided it pleases you, my God. So that was the spirit of availability. What did the sisters do, those of you that are interested in nursing? Superiors called for some of the more experienced sisters, the older ones, those in their 40s, um, but that had solid experience. Um, and others who were younger and were just starting out as the years wore on, um, they practically, some had practically just entered the community and they were sent out on a m mission of military nursing. So the, the sisters did bedside nursing, triage on battlefield, emergency treatment in ambulances, and only six, based on my research, had had prior experience in treating patients with contagious diseases like cholera, yellow fever, and smallpox. Those that weren't uh, the, quote, trained nurses, we would say, would be involved in pastoral care roles, counseling, befriending, letter writing, carrying, going to the stores, the sanitary commission stores to get <coughs> supplies, etc. The sisters served in 15 states and the District of Columbia. Why were Catholic nurses sought? There was a shortage of surgeons. The Confederacy didn't have a medical unit. And there was a lack of, there were no nursing schools, so there wasn't a cadre of trained nurses to call on. But the sisters had been operating hospitals for over 30 years, public hospitals and Catholic hospitals. They were the ones with the experience. In so doing, the transcription and the preparation, I wanted to capture the women's voices as they wrote. Not all of them were highly educated. But neither was the English language standardized in terms of spelling, punctuation, etc. So spell check doesn't work on 19th century uh. English. <laughs> but their quaint phraseology and lack of, of uh, punctuation was preserved for the most part. One of the most significant things the sisters had to battle or deal with, let me say, was the anti-Catholic prejudice prevailing in the United States. 
And from the cover, anyone who is not familiar with the traditional habit of the Daughters of Charity, we are or were the original flying nuns. <laughs> so if we, we stood out, and many of the soldiers would call us those white bonnet women, and they thought it was the white bonnet religion. One fella in Washington got a day pass, and he went all over Washington, D.C., and all of the stores. Now, that was, metropo that was the most significant metropolitan area, I guess, next to New York and Baltimore. He came back so discouraged, he wanted to buy a new hat for the sister. <laughs> and he said, you know, I could find one. Then one of his buddies said, hey, you know, the sisters don't take any personal gifts. But they loved their, quote, sister, their nurse. There was prejudice against ethnic groups, against the Irish. The German sisters came in very handy because there was there were some German soldiers, and in order to care for them or for them to receive the sacraments, the sisters needed to understand them. And they could also, at least pr primarily in Philadelphia, I'm thinking of, located a German-speaking priest who could minister to them. Although we have a tradition of writing our annals or our diaries of the province since 1809, there has never been found a word of political commentary or political opinion on current issues. So despite the um, device of 1860 presidential election, there's no mention of it or the issues of the day or mentions of slavery versus emancipation. The sisters were recognized as benevolent women of compassion who really would care for each soldier or person that came their way without discrimination of any type. And many times the, the soldiers were known to say when they would see a sister, Oh, we're going to be okay now. The Sisters of Charity are here. There won't be any more favoritism. Very briefly, the Vincentian family roots are in uh, America through Elizabeth Seton. And shortly, while she was living, in fact, the Vincentian, uh, the Congregation of the Mission arrived. And in 1828, the sisters opened their first hospital, the first hospital west of the Mississippi and the first Catholic hospital in the United States. One of them, who subsequently was involved in opening the first Catholic hospital to care for persons with mental illness, Sister Matilda Coscari, was also involved in nursing in the Civil War and left abundant accounts. She also had compiled about 1840, before that, a book on, a textbook, I am told, Advices to Care for the Sick, which predates Florence Nightingale. And that's published in another text that I co-authored entitled Enlightened Charity. So at the dawn of the Civil War, we were as far north as Boston, down to New Orleans, and across the Rockies in California. The request for nursing came within three months of the Battle of Fort Sumter, the fall. Medical authorities recognized the need, and they turned to the sisters. First of all, in New Orleans, to care for um, medical, to provide medical care at the Marine Hospital in New Orleans. And then the next month, the federal government asked for sisters to care for their people in Portsmouth, Virginia. And in May, in Richmond, the Confederate officials, since that was the seat of the Confederacy, um, requested us to admit 
uh, soldiers in St. Francis de Sales Infirmary. And the need just grew, the request grew. This is a close up of where we did have missions at the time. This is an example of how a sister was summoned very early in June of 1861. Sister Valentine Latourode was quite competent and they said, honey, come home and leave Sister Theodora in charge. This is a picture of Sister Anne Simeon Norris, who was the superior of the province at the time. And it was she who handled all the comings and goings and the agreements to serve. But in her wisdom and with the collaboration of Father Berlando, they also very prudently agreed to something that's unusual, delegated authority. So if something happened in Virginia, which it did, and the communication was cut, then the sister in Virginia made the decisions. So this is Sister Euphemia, who was sent down to the South to live down there and support the sisters in the South during the period when there was no communication with the North, meaning with Emmitsburg. And when I was in Paris, probably in 2010, after I'd finished what I came to look at, I said, do you have any letters from the United States? Oh, may we. And they opened up the box and I flipped through and I found five letters from sisters during the Civil War that had never seen the light of day here in the States. And what they were, they were from sisters down here writing to Paris to tell them about what was happening here in Donaldsonville and the Southern Missions and Mobile. And there was a consistent thread that was very poignant. Our biggest hardship is not being able to communicate. They felt isolated. They couldn't keep up with not so much their friends, but the support network of, of the community. Therefore, in terms of the delegated authority, these cities became, in fact, hubs from which sisters from that city or nearby missions would be deployed. They would be sent out according to the needs. I would like to just give you an overview of this situation because it, it's something that I learned that I was not aware of, and the document is only, only found in the book that, that I discovered. So this is Pensacola, pre-metropolitan Pensacola. And, well, my colors don't show up very well. This is the, this is the northern Fort Pickens. Right, right there. <laughs> okay. This is the Bay of Pensacola, and this is an old fort from the Spanish era where it was near Fort McRae. Today, this is on the United States Air Force base. We were sent to a town called Warrington, which at that time was right here, but subsequently has been moved. We had a hospital here. Intelligence was that the northern troops were going to bombard across. You can see right across on a clear day. It's not far at all. And the officials here ordered the sisters to move over to these clumps of trees, the woods. Pick up your patients and walk. They put the sick in wagons and moved them. These trees are still there. This is still there. 
It was awesome to see the remnants almost intact and to realize this is what the sisters saw. So the, the sick were moved over here for longer periods of time than they would like, especially in the rain. Three sisters remained here and spent the time going out and in, out and in, out and in, so that the impression given to the folks that were looking across the bay was business as usual. And it really wasn't. But the idea was to save the sick and continue their um, rehabilitation and recuperation. In her own words, Sister Mary Agnes, who was one of the ones going over to the woods, wrote, we received the word to fly to the woods with all the very sick as the hospital was to be bombarded. The sick were put into wagons and carried about two miles into the woods <coughs> with three sisters at the request of the council. And she continued, our abode in the woods, temporary sheds erected in case of an emergency. Cooking was done by the side of a log or stump. For weeks we had continual rain. Our poor sick died one after another from exposure. Our sheds were about 40 yards apart. Going from one to the other, our coronet <laughs> suffered. Only a woman would put that in. <laughs> Obliged to cook over the embers. But that was a new piece of information that we had not known. In the same area, a chaplain was about to be executed for something that he had done and he begged on his knees and he wasn't executed but somehow General Bragg or one of his men found this gold cross and then had it engraved and presented it to the Daughters of Charity. Another one of the major contributions and I'm only using the East Coast portion, was medical transports, taking the sick and the wounded to where they can get care. This particular ship, the Robert Morris, would go from Yorktown, Virginia, to a town on the Pamunkey River, White House Landing. For years, I thought that was the White House um, at Arlington but I mean, it's not. This is the humble little White House, which had been the home of the Custis and Lee families, but became the temporary residence of the Daughters of Charity. And I found a diary written in pencil by one of the sisters who was in the group and what they did about moving into that house for the temporary period, how Father Berlando said mass on a sideboard, and how they distributed themselves for sleeping. Um, it's rather humorous to read. But that's the White House that was burned right after the sisters left. The transports would then take them, the, the patients, to Point Lookout. And you see they also had a prison here. So there really wasn't much escaping because you've got the Chesapeake on one side and the, oh, that's the Chesapeake and the Potomac on the other, unless you're a really good swimmer. So the, the Daughters of Charity were there and one of the sisters who had been on the transports was only 19, Sister Consolata Conlon, and she'd been caring for patients Somehow she picked up typhus. As soon as she landed at Point Lookout, she died. The military were really upset about it, and she was the only victim of the Daughters of Charity from a war-related injury or service. No one was shot, no one got bullets, although a bullet went through her coronet one time. 
but she was our only victim and she was called by them and given a military funeral a martyr of charity but that is the Hammond General Hospital um, and this is Sister Consolata she was buried there and then years after the war exhumed and moved to the community plot in Washington DC there are three factors that I wanted to highlight um, in terms of our military nursing. Personal safety and military security. Um, one of the overwhelming things was so many patients already had tuberculosis, so their health care was, their health status was already compromised. But since we're all body, mind, and spirit, the sisters always carried what they call delicacies, little jellies, or I guess little cookies, little sweet things, unusual things that would cheer the, the patient's um, spirits. One note from the Satterley Hospital, we had upwards of 90 cases, about nine or 10 died, two had the black smallpox. They were much benefited and very little marked by drinking freely of the tea made of Saracenia purpura, pitcher's plant. So the sisters were very familiar with alternative um, remedies. One day I was advising an application to a man's face for poison. He wouldn't see the doctor because he said he did, it wouldn't do him any good. And I told him that this remedy had cured a sister who was poisoned. The man looked astonished and said, why? I did not know sisters ever got anything like that. <laughs> I said, well, to be sure they do. Are they not liable to take diseases as well as anyone else? To be sure not, he said. For the boys often say they must be different from other people, for they never get sick, and they do for us what no person else would do. They're not afraid of fevers, smallpox, or anything else. One time the sisters arrived, um, this is Satterley where that happened, where we had so many, um, about 91 sisters all together. But aside from the um, big shots and the sister that is standing, Sister Gonzaga Grace, look at the fellow looking out the window. He's probably bedridden. Um, we were in Georgia and had just alighted from the coach and people were looking at us like we were so curious and strange. And then finally, a little child said, oh, she talked. It, it talked. They didn't know if we were human. When we arrived at Antietam, the men said, oh, they're the Sisters of Charity. Now both parties will be served alike. There were instances of prisoners who were the equivalent of death row and were about to be um, executed. In several instances, the sisters were involved not only in ministry to them, but in advocating for their lives. And their, their luck was half and half. Um, I want to move to Antietam. We look we looked around for axes or hatchets for splitting rails to continue to roof as best we could with blankets tied to sticks driven in earth. So this is exactly Antietam, bodies were everywhere. And this priest who accompanied the sisters from Emmitsburg is someone who was very significant on the battlefield and untiring in his ministry, but 13 years later came to Chicago and he bought property amid cow pastures, which is where we're seated now. He bought the property for what is now DePaul University. 
some of the soldiers told the sisters that really they had been, they'd received orders from their generals to capture Sisters of Charity if they could, as their hospitals really needed some. The story of Daniel Sickles, he lost his leg in Gettysburg. As you see, this is a post-Gettysburg image. But the fact is, when he came to Washington where his doctor was, his personal nurse was Sister Mary Carroll, who was in charge of several of the Washington <laughs> hospitals and our own Providence Hospital. And he attributes his healing and recuperation not only to Dr. Sims, but to the nursing of Sister Mary Carroll. When the sisters went to Gettysburg, obviously it was one gruesome picture to behold, and I did not take any pictures to portray it, but Sister Matilda said, our, carriages, our carriage wheels rolling in blood, our horses could hardly be made to proceed from the terrific sight of the dead men and horses. The men flat on their backs, arms stretched out like a cross, and the horses' limbs spreading and stretched every way. The eyes of some of the dead standing out of their sockets. This is her original copy, and that's a map of Gettysburg. In Richmond and in other places, occasionally there'd be an artist. This gentleman that drew this sketch it was an illustrator for um, Leslie's Weekly, so we, and it signed Roswell Shersteff. When they went to, and I'm going to begin to wrap up so that we can have time for discussion or questions and answers. When we went to Hopper's Ferry, Sister said the heat was excessive and one of our horses gave out. Now, you do remember the sisters wore about 13 pounds of wool the same wool that they wore in Paris and in France and Germany where they didn't have heat in the houses. Well, this is the United States in uh, July and it's hot and humid. They were no, they'd no longer gotten there, settled, set up for a day or two, and they got the reverse of the order. Evacuate immediately. We were now to cross the Potomac, the battle line, and on this bridge, kegs of powder were placed in case the Northern Army approached. It would be instantly blown up. So as they escaped and they moved further into uh, Virginia, eventually into Lynchburg, but in their stay in Danville, Virginia, they said, the sisters had a nice little house, which would have been a luxury had it not been the abode of innumerable rats, of whom we had the greatest awe. During the night, shoes, stockings, etc., were carried off. Indeed, safe we did not feel for our fingers and toes, which we often found on waking, locked in the teeth of our bold visitors. <clears throat> Charity Hospital in New Orleans was certainly a hub <clears throat> giving good food was essential for the health of the soldiers. This is the Satterley kitchen. And when there was an encampment of probably 40,000 Union troops at Emmitsburg on our own property, it was a ceaseless tide of famished soldiers. And we, the sisters were told they really, that the general de Trobion, they really didn't know if perhaps the battle would be fought as the Battle of Emmitsburg, and Gettysburg's less than 10 miles away. Despite all that, we opened numerous new missions. We admitted 1,000 more candidates into the sisterhood during those war years. And even though some women were seen impersonating us, uh, they were caught, and the sisters that they were impersonating were really uh, mortified which led to the enforcement of passports and identification. But as soon as the agents would see us, they'd say, go on, sister, or they'd just take the paper and write examine. So and everything that the Mission of Charity accomplished during those wartime years, we really lived the Vincentian tradition. And 
Vincent said that men go to war to kill one another, but that we we go to to restore life, or at least to help and preserve it for those who survive by the care we give. Because even in the 17th century, we were angels on the battlefield. The sisters were recognized for their competence. They operated out of a culture of collaboration. And in, the, in America, one of their major contributions was as Catholic women serving everyone without discrimination, the religious and anti-Catholic prejudice decreased. And there's numerous quotes to that. So with that, I would like to conclude and open the floor for any questions or comments you may have. Because as you see, um, I'm filled with it and could go on for a few more hours. So are there any questions or comments? Paula is passing out a selected bibliography, which it, you may find of interest if you wish to pursue this topic further. These are the sources that I recommend. There are a few other sources out there which did not make the cut for various reasons. In terms of scholarship, yes, Andrew. That's sort of a historiographical question for you, um, which is, you know, War often gives um, the Vincentian arena a chance to kind of meld with the popular, the history of, of, of popular culture. Um, and I've, I've been somewhat surprised that um, this particular topic hasn't really been touched on um, by some of the, the more popular studies of the Civil War documentaries. Um, of the past, and I'm wondering if you can maybe speak to why you think that might be the case, uh, and and you know why it is that so much of the study of this is being done by women religious. Thank you for your question. Women religious are proud of the contributions of their elder sisters. It is an era when. It's very important to unearth contributions of women and let the voices of women be heard. Many public historians have not only ignored the contribution of religious women, or the story has been undertold. Most notably, there's no mention in the extremely comprehensive um, documentary on the Civil War by Ken Burns. Most historians perhaps are interested in the strategy, the military strategy. I know that our own Margaret Story here did a study on civilian life during the war, I believe in Tennessee. So unless one looks further down or looks beyond the battle, it's not recognized. And also, the Civil War created tremendous number of veterans and with disabilities. Many of those remained in our hospitals, our established hospitals, some till the day they, they went to eternity. Um, but the veterans question is, is another issue that's understudied. I would um, be willing and love to talk with anyone that would be interested in pursuing a documentary or further um, exploration of religious women and their contributions to the Civil War effort. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a little bit more of a specific question about something you had said. Um, you mentioned that only six sisters had the previous previous experience with like contagious diseases and that sort of thing. I'm just curious how many or like a percentage uh, were actually like trained nurses before they came to the service. 
one must study the history of nursing to really answer that because the first school of nursing didn't begin, I believe, until um, 1889. So women had a, didn't have a profession beyond the home. They were, their role was to be homemakers. For the Daughters of Charity and, and many women, there's a tradition of home remedies that has come down through the ages, oral tradition and, and practice. So Louise de Marriac was very knowledgeable about alternative medicines and herbal remedies, et cetera. And our sisters ran pharmacies, so we were knowledgeable in, in that way. One of the American sisters who was extremely knowledgeable about pharmacology had been trained by um, a medicine man, um, pharmacologist in, in lowercase, and that had information was passed on and used. And then Sister Matilda Coskery had a vast array of knowledge. At the very beginning, um, with the St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, her spiritual director was Father Simon Gabriel Brute, a Sulpician who, before he entered the priesthood, was a medical doctor and graduated first in his class from the Sorbonne. Now, at that time, I'm told that Catholic priests were not permitted to practice medicine or be involved in bloodletting. So, when we went into our first hospital in, in Baltimore, that was the Baltimore Infirmary in 1823, what that really was was a teaching hospital for the University of Maryland Medical School students, and we were in charge of the nursing aspect, but because it was a teaching hospital, the physicians were very, um, the sisters were very well educated by physicians in terms of uh, medicines and remedies and compounds. Thank you for your question. Yes. In following up with that and in reference to your, your quotation from the doctor to the camp follower about become a the lady. nurse, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you see this fitting into the wider history of nursing? Uh, it's not a field I know much about, but I know you know pre uh, Florence Nightingale and in the British world there was this very heavily uh, heavy prejudice against nurses by the physicians and surgeons. Did you see any aspect of that in your in your writings? Well, in the, in the British world and the Crimean War experience with with Florence Nightingale, my impression was. It was male control, um, and women really didn't belong here, but it was also extremely, extreme, uh, terrible conditions that Florence Nightingale was trying to, to remedy. Um, it, it just was unbelievable. On this side of the pond, the daughters had the experience and the um, credibility because of their hospital experience, so they were well respected. And the American culture lent itself a little more to uh, self-reliance and a culture of collaboration. And the men knew they couldn't do it, meaning the, there weren't surgeons, they had to create a medical department in the Confederacy. So they were very happy to have someone that at least had some idea of what to do and how to do it. That would, would be my take, but I think it's something that certainly could be considered. Um, but the, the Daughters of Charity were doing very um, skilled nursing care before Florence Nightingale tried to reorganize the service delivery at the Crimean War. And some of the veterans from the Crimean War were over here and had been recruited and were in the Civil War, the Zwabi units. And when they would see a sister appear, they'd say, oh, Sisters of Charity, I knew them in the Crimean War. You can trust them. Because the, the, the French sisters were over there. Yes, Paula? Um, sister Betty Ann, would you mind sharing a little bit about the Chicago connection with Holy Name School? Okay, there's so much that I was not able to um, share with you. There's the Chicago connection with Father Smith. 
there's also a Chicago connection with a young drummer boy that came with the 40,000 troops that paraded and camped on our grounds three days before the Battle of Gettysburg, whom we prayed away, and they went to Gettysburg. But 50 years later, the little drummer boy, and now a mature uh, gentleman, came back with some of his cronies and wanted permission to reenact the, the march, which he did. But he became a graduate of Northwestern and had, dental, had a dental practice down in the loop near where uh, DePaul campus is, Dr. Barnes. But the specific um, question relates to Holy Name School. Some of the, we came to Chicago in 1861 and we staffed St. Uh, Holy, Holy Name School and we had a outreach ministry called the House of Providence, both of which we lost in the Chicago fire. Of the sisters that came first, some of them were nurses in the Civil War and they would leave in the summer and go do military nursing and return, shall we say, for the fall term. One of the names that appears on some records as having been named to come to Chicago is the sister Consolata Conlon, the 19-year-old who died of typhus because of her service on the transport boats. On the other hand, the records are conflicted because another record says she was in New Orleans, but I haven't been able to find her name in New Orleans, so I don't know if she was actually here or not here, but um, I think it's Anne Regina Jordan was definitely a Civil War nurse, and I do believe there's some of our Civil War nurses that are buried here in, um, the, is it Mount Calvary Cemetery? Is that the name of the Catholic Cemetery? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Father Reibold. I know from my own studies that the, the sisters were often invited to come to different countries in Latin America, uh, and in Guatemala, for example, Chile, mm -hmm. Peru, and so on. And when they invite, when they arrived, they discovered and this is a standard story. They they found the hospital in a terrible condition, and within a month, the thing was as as brilliant and wonderful as and nobody had ever seen a hospital like that. And I'm wondering where did they get this information? This is in the 1860s, really, in the 70s. And so. We were competent women. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's the answer. Yes. Well, we were invited to the. Um, what was called the Pest House in, in Lynchburg. And it was just that. The, it was the contagious diseases, and I forget which epidemic it was, but the doctor had such a high mortality rate, but he, he'd heard about the sisters. The sisters got the mortality rate practically down to zero. And do you know how they did it? And it's a tiny little hospital. This room is bigger than that place. <laughs> they picked the cracks, they picked the dirt out of the cracks on the floor, which is where the germs were residing. So cleanliness was something that um, maybe there wasn't a name for it at the, that time, but it was a practice. Just like in France, the mansard roofs um, were known for clean, clean air. The, the ventilation, and we built um, porches on our hospital so that patients would have access to clean air in the upper floors. A lot had, a lot of tradition had passed down, and it all ain't written down, but it, it was knowledge. Thank you for bringing up that, about the consultation, yes. If there are no further comments or questions, may I encourage you who are on faculty, this book could really be used in gender studies, in history studies, in nursing studies. The government had me come over and talk to their, um, one of their cohorts of students that come in the summer on emergency management for the Emergency Management Institute on how we uh, handled the Gettysburg scenario. 
So there's a lot of very rich material in here that's beyond simply the Civil War, but can be used to enhance our, our knowledge of this period and the Vincentian experience and mission. So thank you very much for coming today. And I hope that you've taken away something that you hadn't known before, because I learned a lot in the preparation of this also. Thank you.